the first thing before you buy anything is to have the attitude of being a contrarian. And that is my single biggest piece of advice I give to every new investor into the market. And to be a contrarian means to be opposite to groupthink. And if you can do that continuously through the crypto market, you'll be successful. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the My Future Business Show. My name's Rick Nusky. I am your host. And for everybody supporting the show and being around for a while, thank you very much for your ongoing support. And for those of you who are new here today, welcome. Now, I know that you're in for a surprise a treat because on today's show, I have the pleasure of welcoming author and co-founder of Digital Wealth Group, Sidel Sierra. Welcome to the show, Sidel. Thanks, Rick. Um, absolute pleasure to be here today. It's great to have you here. Now, you and I are going to be talking about your latest book, All Time High, The Power of Cryptocurrencies and How to Invest the Right Way, along with why everyday people should look at crypto investments as a vehicle for creating financial freedom. So there is a lot to unpack in a short amount of time there. So where are you calling in from today? Uh, so I'm based in the beautiful Gold Coast on in Australia, and uh, it's an absolute beautiful spot to be out here, out in the hinterland. So, oh, yes. <laughs> surrounded by the rainforests and the elements. So. Now, now tell me something. I know that you were recently on realestate.com.au. You had sold a property. Are you nearby where you used to be, or have you shifted completely? Uh, yes, that's that's all in the process at the moment. So that's uh, uh, yeah, relocating and all the all the the joys that come with with relocating. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there are some other. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. So uh, yes, on realestate.com, um, I, I do love my properties and and beautiful spots around Australia. But um, yeah, decided to move back down to the the coast, yep. back down to the beach lifestyle. Very nice. And, uh, and yeah. Yep. So what what are you looking forward to in your next move? That beach lifestyle is one of them, but uh, what else are you looking forward to? Uh, mainly just being probably part of the community. Again, it's quite isolated out in the hinterland <laughs> area. And yep. as wonderful it is, it's uh, probably a little bit close to the retirement vibe up here than I think I, <laughs> as much as I love my retirement, I do enjoy being uh, amongst amongst the action for my age, I guess. Yeah, well, we're saying that, you know, what what types of hobbies and sports do you get into? What, what's your thing? Uh, well, surprisingly, I actually love uh, supercars and uh, I do love the, the the luxury vehicle side of things, a Formula One. I have a, a beautiful Formula One Aston Martin um, collectible item. I have um, beautiful Porsches and Mercedes Benz, and yes. I do like to take. I do like to go for um, nice cruises and meet lots of wonderful car enthusiasts. Um, it's actually just recently part of a big, the big charity run that happened in the Gold Coast uh, on the weekend, and. And it's just a lovely community of people, like-minded people who yeah. enjoy their nice cars. So probably don't look like the car person, but I absolutely appreciate a nice luxury vehicle. Absolutely. <laughs> look, I can't say that I'm a luxury car guy, but I have a collection of uh, mini Mokes, special export Mokes. That's my thing. I love cars oh, really? too. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Anything collectible is enjoyable, whether it's coins, stamps, cars, uh, vintage things, whatever it is, motorbikes. It's Everything and anything goes. Now, tell me a little bit about F1. Daniel Ricciardo, what do you think he's going to do? You think he's going to come back with a, with a storm or what? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I think uh, I kind of think he needed to have stayed with Red Bull right at the very beginning yes. and, uh, and just keep to what he knew best. Um, but I think the sort of the chase for fame got to him perhaps. And yep. um, I think that's sort of when he, where he went off. But um, my brother actually went to school with Daniel Ricciardo oh. knows him quite well and went know the family and where he used to learn racing and things like that so <laughs> funny that you mentioned him <laughs> yeah well there you go yeah the small yeah. world just got that sm uh, little bit that's smaller. much smaller <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. tell me um Sido, what are your favorite foods when you and do you go out for a meal what's your thing you like socializing uh i'm a little bit of a recluse uh these days i do I uh, love my, I do grow my own organic vegetables and I do my own organic cooking. Um, I'm very much into eating very well and, and um, nourishment. And I was vegetarian and vegan, did the whole vegan thing for a while and I'm not, not there anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> I've sort of I've experimented with all the different types of things that people like to do. But I love, I do love cooking. It's like one of my, one of my um, switch off things that I that I enjoy doing. So. Yeah, well, look, you know, yeah. you're certainly very busy, so I'm, I'm pretty sure you appreciate the downtime. But when you do get some downtime, I love a movie. Do you like a good movie now and then? 
Yeah, I do, yes. What type of movies are you into? <laughs> well, when I say downtime, I think what, what downtime, but <laughs> my downtime is, is sort of just when I go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with but, you. Uh, I don't know. I do enjoy. Uh, I do enjoy watching all the Formula One Netflix stuff as well. I, I probably enjoy more short little TV series. I love the long historical type movies. I'm never really into the fiction or that sort of uh, stuff. superhero stuff. I really like true stories and historical things. Or I, I love um, anything to do with horses and and the sort of that sort of um, side of things. I love watching you know uh, real life stories, even the sporting. Yep. You see. Um, you know those rise to fame. I love a good underdog story. Rags to riches, yeah. Well, you, I, I really guess, like a good that. A I, good I story guess you'd like love the uh, new Ferrari movie that's coming out. Have you seen anything about that? I have seen the ads, but I haven't watched it yet. No, so me neither. I'm looking forward to that. Definitely on the hit list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely on the hit list. <laughs> now you you touched on horses. Now, when I was growing up, I lived on a farm and we had cattle. We had this and that. We had goats, sheep, and all the rest of it. Did, tell us about life growing up. Ah, so I actually grew up in a country town north of Perth called yep. Lancelin. My father was a he was he's been a martial artist. He's taught probably thirty thousand something students in his lifetime. So he had a, a martial arts school, like a small school, um, running from our backyard, as well as being a professional fisherman. So he used to bring back all of the fresh caught stuff straight off the boat, caught a one hour before, and we pretty much grew up. Um, with that sort of lifestyle, very it. much beach, fresh fish. My mum was a baker, so we grew up with lots of lovely food. And um, and then we eventually moved back down to Perth because they didn't really want us growing up in such a small country town. So uh, from there, we we grew up in Perth and uh, and very much was part of our martial arts schools. Um, I fought, we we I say uh, we spent half our time at home and half our time at the the martial arts academy, which is actually one of the biggest in Australia hundreds of students and um, was put into the Hall of Fame, all sorts of things in China and Kuala Lumpur. And, wow. Um, it's been an amazing journey and very interesting, I would say a very interesting upbringing. I've met so many people, so many masters, masters that have trained with Jet Li and Jackie Chan and, and trained personally with Bruce Lee, all these sorts of things. We've written um, so many pieces about all the stories from these masters. And so I kind of grew up with this very international Met flavor. so many different people. Yeah, international flavour. Yeah. We've been to China so many times, all through Southeast Asia, and and had many unique experiences like that. So my upbringing was very focused around you know mindset and and discipline and keeping focused, and then also that martial arts side where you very much become, you know, you're very much working with your body, mind, and spirit all at once. So mm. we had a very, I would say, disciplined but not disciplined. I don't know. I w wasn't regimented, but it was definitely, we learnt a lot of amazing skills from that. Upbringing. I can imagine. Look, um, I've had a long and illustrious uh, life with martial arts, uh, working under Kancho Sensei Bob Sullivan, and now my children uh, are, are 9 and 11. They're just about to go for their black belt grading. Now, what they've learnt, and I want you to talk to this, is the importance of discipline. What do you what do you think about discipline and, and why is it so important in our lives? Oh gosh, I'm so passionate about this because I used to teach um, pretty much up until the age of twenty something, twenty seven. I was teaching junior all the kids classes yep, yep. Um, from the age of four, and one of the biggest things I noticed was that that shift when they would res start to respond to the discipline and. And discipline is that framework. It gives us boundary. It gives us structure. Yep. It gives us something that we have, um, we can sort of like understand our framework and where our, where our limits are. And I found that the kids that would respond to that discipline, like in, in, in the healthy ways, which we had through the martial arts school, it would be, they would just learn that they couldn't get away with everything and that life was not just a game and that, you know, there was things that they, you know, we do have to respect one another. We do have to listen to people. We do have to have general manners. You know, you can't be just throwing a tantrum in the middle of a floor with 30 other children <laughs> on, on the, you know, around you. In you can't desert. be sitting, standing yeah. there with your arms crossed and like, you know, life doesn't work that way. No. You know? So they learned so many practical life skills and those skills, discipline is just one of those things that I don't think, I think it's one of those losing skills those uh, losing values that oh, – so, sorry, one of those values that I see getting lost in yeah. society today, people oh. don't want the discipline to commit to things, to see have longevity, to commit to one another, to give their word and hold themselves to that. Yeah. And I really think um, 
it's one of those skills that is sort of dying, but it's it's such a unique thing when someone really has a good level of, of discipline. You certainly have uh, gone up a notch in my book in terms of your background that you've shared thus far. And I think I'll be sharing this interview with my children just to remind them, <laughs> I want to stay home and play my computer games today, Daddy. Do you mind? <laughs> yes, I do mind. Off you go. <laughs> now, you've already, you've already talked about some incredibly talented individuals in your life, but I also see uh, some other inspirational people, the likes of Harry Dent, Robert Kaisaki and the likes, and, and you've shared the stuff with some of these incredible people tell us about those experiences mm. oh yes Rick. like it's been an amazing very organic journey something that my my brother and i actually co-founded digital wealth group yep. together and we didn't expect we did not expect it to go the way we did but in a way we sort of did because we were very focused on on getting the message to as many people as possible but we were very lucky to have uh spoken and met these individuals uh been on tours with them shared dinners with them and had have, have that have had this lovely experience of just hearing life from a different side and really seeing what how they work how they see the world which is often very different to well for me personally it was very different to the way i saw the world and and so that was very interesting to get those experiences but more so to see just sort of the following these people had and the influence that they had as well and the respect that they drew from the audience and to to be uh to be part of that whole tour where, where i said we live we live more in our suitcase out yeah. of our suitcase more than we did at home for a period yeah. of time yeah. but it was really worth it it was a whirlwind and it was of absolutely course. so exciting and, and very very tiring at the same time but extremely rewarding yeah well when you go to sleep you know it's well worthwhile but um tell me what what with all the the caliber of the people that you've existed around thus far what's the commonality between all of them do you think oh gosh i've met so many wonderful people i, I would definitely say it is their mindset and yep. it is the thing that is it's their it's the stories they tell within their mind it's the it's this undercurrent i would say discipline is one of them yeah but very being extremely mindful of what they say how they think the actions they take so it's the way they're, they're very not it's not a controlling way but it's a very disciplined approach to the way they express themselves i would find that is a commonality amongst all of them yep. they are very aware of, they're very self-aware very self-aware type people and do you find that they're selfless that help helping others more more so than themselves well, you know what's interesting is that many of them had to be extremely selfish to be selfless. And I think this is the biggest thing, the biggest mistake a lot of new so business people make is is they, they want to help everyone else before they help themselves. Mm. They sort of share from an, an, a, like a half full cup. Um, but I always say to become that role model and be that change yourself first. And then that has like an eminent, it has a, then you almost somewhat have a, a level of gravity, a level of um, influence because you are living in alignment to what you are preaching. Yeah. And what I found these people do is they don't need to prove themselves. They don't need to say anything. They don't need to be anything. They just are and you can feel it. Yeah. And they hold it in the way they speak, the way they stand, their, their confidence. Because they have made it, they have achieved that level of success. And from that, that level of selflessness, they they are very generous with their time, very generous with their knowledge, very generous with what they want to give because they've got nothing more to prove. They don't. It, it, that's that was the common thing that I found the most. They've, they've the climbed the peak to success, and now it's time to give back. Loving the call. Thank you very much, Sadell. Yeah. Now, tell yeah. me a little bit about um, your day. Are, are you an early riser? What's what's the daily routine look like? <laughs> well, I used to be a late riser until my partner, <laughs> and then he he was like, "No, you, early mornings are better." And so, I mean, I'm very flexible. I sort of become an early riser now, but I must say, my routine gets a bit thrown out in the nature of the industry that I do because I'm speaking with some people from the US, from the UK, uh, from around the world, and we have uh, time zones going on all the time. All the time. <laughs> time zone conflicts, but I mean, I don't really think about it too much, but. You know, my day is my day is pretty relaxed. I get to do a lot of my day is very varied, right from my own personal crypto investing to maybe cooking. I do many things, run the household uh, as course, well, yeah, and yeah. And, uh, and do my book writing and um, and of course digital wealth group presentations. And I've got wonderful team around me that help to keep everything running nicely, which was a big lesson for me and also delegating and, and not doing everything myself. And it was when I sort of could change that, my day and life became a lot more free. 
That's just the thing, isn't it? Now, tell me a little bit about your first entrepreneurial experience. When were you first exposed to this wonderful world of entrepreneurialism? Oh, gosh, I feel like I've been an entrepreneur you know, for forever. a decade. <laughs> um, my parents actually took us to business workshops from probably the age of 12, 13. Yep. And uh, we would go to these money mindset training courses, these motivational speech, sort of those um, two to three day workshop environments where you're surrounded by other business owners and then they would get us to join into the business conversations or the goal setting or the mindset stuff and so we would be sitting next to you know opposite like I remember sitting opposite women and men uh, when I was about 13 talking about you know what what are your financial goals you know and I'd be, I'd be, uh, pocket money and uh, lunch ice cream money. <laughs> you know so but I would um what I found interesting was I would notice the things that a lot of the adults when I back to then would say and a question in my head was often how did some of them get to where they were in life but how did some of them become so lost at life and sort of maybe pessimistic sometimes like mm. I noticed there was this theme of like they had almost like regretted things they had done or there was things where they were found themselves lost and unsure what their next step was and I always wondered at the back of my mind what were the choices that they made what got them to that point because we sort of have so much potential in our life but how do we sort of end up in a spot where we feel so stuck where yeah. we feel so lost and I found that interesting as well as li listening to the, the success stories in the room the people that were doing property and stock so my mum would actually sign us up to these courses, $3,000 courses, $10,000 courses in our later teens to learn about stocks, learn about property, learn about um, even food and health, uh, boot camps for brains, all sorts of different things. So yeah. we were around a lot of entrepreneurs from quite a young age. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, I, I just wonder in all of this, um, how, how important, you know, you talked about almost, for lack of better words for it, the misery that can come along with it if you don't set yourself up properly. You know, having uh, wealth is one thing, but there's different types of wealth, health and happiness. Which out of those three do you think is the most important for you? Oh, I mean, gosh, I always say that our health is the most important because if we don't have our mental or physical health, we literally cannot do anything. Yeah. I moments where I've been, you know, feeling really be sick and I think I can't do anything and nothing <laughs> else matters so health is always my number one and but I, I just think I think overall I feel like it's it, we can grow our say actual dollars in our bank account but then can we maintain that wealth and what are the belief patterns that are running underneath that and we we never if we some oftentimes we think back in our whole lives where do we ever or where have we ever learned how to grow our mindset how to have an abundance mindset, how to attract wealth and keep wealth and grow wealth and hand it down for generations to come. Yep. And when you start to think about those things, it's often we probably never have had that. So it's it's quite interesting that but many people have this sort of assumed pressure on themselves that we should be able to do that. But I said, I always ask the question, where did you ever learn? You know, yep. so it's a skill many people don't think to acquire for themselves. Do you, like, just for sake of context, um, in terms of your educational and professional background, um, what, what's the, uh, what does that look like? And did you learn more once you left, you know, quote unquote, schooling than when you stepped into real life? Uh, well, I actually went to university. So mm -hmm. I actually graduated with a degree in maths and physics. So I did go through the whole you know, high school, graduate year 12, go to four, about four, I did four years of university. Yep. Uh, then I went into, I was, you know, doing lecturing and I was running labs and I was doing those sorts of things. So I was, I've always been like a teacher, I guess. Yep. Um, so that was more my journey. But then I, after that, I went very much into business and I was mentored by a lot of very successful mentors, which was, I was lucky to align myself with. It was sort of fluky chances <laughs> across <laughs> Habit of meeting at the coffee shop type thing and <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you know timing alignment sort of stuff and uh and my 20s was spent very much in that business entrepreneurial world and and crypto sort of came later in my sort of later 20s um and by the age of 30 my brother and I had retired off crypto and then that was where people were asking us how did you you know how so there's been a lot of self-education I would say I've never I've never worked for someone else actually I did I have worked for someone else for about three months when I was a teenager. <laughs> always worked for myself. Yeah. Now tell me, you've probably done so much already, but do you have a bucket list and what's on it? 
Do I have a bucket list? Uh, it's hard to say, honest, isn't it? Oh my god! Like I, 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 you know, I feel like so much of the bucket list items I've been able to do with crypto and and yep. since our finances, like the, a lot of the things people would, would would love to have on their bucket list, or maybe like travel the world or snowboard somewhere or have a supercar, live in a luxurious home, um, go on fancy holidays, like all these sorts of things, designer shopping, or maybe materialistic sides of things, or yep. maybe it's been able to write a book one day or do this. So I feel like I've got through a lot of my bucket list that I would find my priorities are probably more changing into to family and, and um, you know, ha- going more into my um, having a family and things like that. So yep. my bucket list is, is becoming more of a... <laughs> slightly different to the material oh look no no it could be it could be physical could be spiritual could be whatever is important to you we're not uh biased in any way shape or form now tell tell us a little bit about uh you know what makes life worthwhile for you right now what's happening in your world that every day you get up and you go you know what this is what i'm living for oh great question i mean i just i'm very grateful for my life and i do believe yeah, I, I, for example, like I wake up and I'm, I'm excited for, uh, gosh, <laughs> the 5,000 projects that I have going at once. <laughs> so I never is a dull moment in my life, but every day is something unique and different. So whether it's, um, you know, organising like something surprise for my family, like a, you know, beautiful holiday for my parents or uh, perhaps it's something for my partner or um, the other thing would be, like in my presentations that I do for Digital Wealth Group, I do a lot of money mindset. I do ins- like free inspirational talks, like all sorts of different things. And maybe it's creating the content for that today or maybe it's um, adding another chapter into my next book or yeah. uh, whatever that may be. I, like I just think it's it's more so my service that actually gets me up in the morning. Uh. And I feel very grateful to have been alignment to the service that is in complete alignment to my purpose so my purpose to teach, to inspire, to to lead others, and every day I'm fulfilling that in various forms. So tell me, when was it that your brother and yourself decided to create Digital Wealth Group? What was the conversation like? <laughs> that was a, that was a funny day, and I, I'll never forget the moment uh, I pulled up in my brother's driveway, and he was on the phone, and he wanted to hang up the phone quickly before I heard the conversation, and he says, "I know you're going to want to do this, but." I don't know if I want to do it, but I know you're not going to let me off the hook. <laughs> and, it, and he says, we've just been asked to share our crypto experience because people were starting to hear about these two crypto guys, you know, my brother and I, these, yep. this crypto brother and sister that was cracking it in crypto. Uh, how are they doing it? And then we got a phone call. Um, it was to speak in front of about 60 investors. But the, the catch was it was a, a few days away and uh, we had no material. Like we had to create 12 oh, presentations from scratch. Seat. It was the hot seat, and <laughs> uh, and we said, yeah, why not? Because that's whatever. Like we're we're cool with that. So yeah, yeah. anyway, uh, late nights, early mornings. We thought it was a bit of a fun challenge. We ended up doing that, and that sort of created one thing after the other after the other. And it was almost that we were asked to come present at these different things, and that eventually uh, was like a word of mouth ripple effect. And it was such an organic beginning to this journey that we never really had a conversation. Okay, let's begin now. It was just. We, we sort of ended up being pulled and guided in that direction. Ah. So it was very much, I feel, we were always meant to do this. We we're always meant to be the ones in Australia to educate people on crypto. We we're always meant to be the ones that would help people do this safely. I really feel like it was, it was like that was our call and role for the cryptocurrency market. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, that's, and that's why I think it's just effortlessly flown so well. And we've, we've attracted so many wonderful clients and people and coaches and team members to, to create such an incredible community that it is today. Um, but I think the whole thing came because we were so passionate from the beginning. We had a, uh, a burning desire to, to share what we knew. We were really passionate about helping people. We loved... Uh, seeing people crack their first, you know, good profit in the market. And that was, I think, just naturally because we love that experience, the byproduct of that was our service and business. That's a beautiful segue into the core of the call, uh, Sidel, and I'd love to go into some nuts and bolts of crypto and cryptocurrencies because there's certainly a lot to learn for somebody who has never heard of this space before. It's very difficult not to know of it be aware of it at least, but the details 
often elude people, I myself included. Now, starting off, what is crypto and why should everyday people consider investing in it? Well, it's a, I mean, I could sit here for the, how many hours? <laughs> how many hours? Have? All day, let's go. <laughs> uh, I think the longest talk I did was about 12 hours. In a, in oh, a goodness, road. no. We've got, we've got, we've got nine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, mainly, mainly, Rick, it's about having, uh, crypto is an asset class that doesn't require you to have a financial background. It doesn't require you to have investment experience, to be a trader, to read charts, it doesn't care what your previous investment history has been like. I say it's an, an asset for the people and it's an asset because it's so, it is simple to enter, even though we're told it isn't. And it's fastest, it is the fastest appreciating asset in the world. So why would we not have a percentage of our portfolio, even if it's a few hundred dollars, a uh, thousand bucks into this market, just to let us, to let it prove to you what it can do for yourself and that barrier to entry, people are quite fearful. They think of the volatility. But the unique thing about this asset class is you don't have to break the bank to get in. You know, you can start with a few hundred dollars. It's not hundreds of thousands of dollars upfront capital to, to say, go into property or whatever these other, other markets can offer. Crypto has a very, uh, very easy entry point in that regard and can be highly rewarding in a very short period of time. There you go. There's a very succinct response. Thank you very much. Now, I don't know necessarily that what I want to ask you is in any particular sequence. So forgive me if I sort of go out of sequence a little bit here. But <laughs> That's I'm, okay. I'm wondering what blockchain is and, and why it's relevant to know how it works when you're investing. Uh, great question. And the short answer is you don't really need to know how blockchain works. It's sort of like, you know, that how does the internet work, but we just use it. Yeah. So I don't know how the internet works, you know, no, how does that, you know, <laughs> and I'm sure many people are in the same boat. I don't really know how my car works, but it drives and it drives well. It's good <laughs> so, enough. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in regard, like there's two aspects of the crypto. You've got the utility, which is the, the function of the market, but then there's the investing into, into the assets. And it's a, it, another way to think of it is like, think of like Apple. You don't have to use their computers, their laptops, their headsets, their iPhones, but you can invest in the company itself. And and there are thousands of cryptos, let's say there are thousands of apples, you could say, uh, that you can invest into that represent that technology and that growth. And so in crypto, we go for the innovation, we go for where the major growth is happening. And then we buy, let's say, those cryptos assigned to that major growth and innovation. And then that's how you hear about people making the, that great success in the crypto market. Yeah, fantastic. Now, I, I, I've heard you say it's better to be proactive, not reactive. So how does that apply to the crypto investment space? <laughs> you have <laughs> followed my one-liners. I have all these one-liners. <laughs> <in there. laughs> and uh, I there's will another say, book. <laughs> yeah, there's another book. Yeah, it's actually, <laughs> I know it's it's in my book. Uh, I talk about, I, I very much talk about being proactive because many people chase the euphoria of the market and unfortunately buy in around the top. So what happens when you do that is you lock in losses for years to come. And when I say years, it's when we until the market picks back up again. Yeah. And I always say, you know, for example, um, here where we sit in March of 2024, we have, uh, you know, we have upside potential in front of us. So I say, wh where are we relative? tip to the mountain like if you think of Mount Everest you know are we going to buy right at the very top or are we going to look at the bottom and look up and say look at all that upside we have in us so we have in front of us so when I say be proactive is is to not uh is to take action and have your positions in before we start to see the market really go parabolic um, because many people get emotionally invested and that's where people make a lot of mistakes and that's where people you end up hearing this and the naysayers and all people lose money and ABC and it's really because they enter at any time when you shouldn't enter at any time. There are really strategic times to enter and it's actually more important than the coins that you intend to buy. Ah, oh, there you go. Now we've touched on mindset quite a bit, but I suspect there's a slight difference between, you know, let's call it a, a typical mindset and a money mindset. How is that different? Well, I, I say when, how can we have the big the, the easiest way to say this is how could we have a five million dollar crypto portfolio with a five thousand dollar mindset because eventually we're going to rewind that money all the way back to about the same level as our money mindset yep. so as much as people are investing and learning about the crypto market i always say because the crypto market can generate wealth quickly like uh, people do use analogies of winning like a lottery that sort of thing and that obviously doesn't happen for everyone but there is a process where you can acquire wealth 
in relatively shorter periods of time compared to other assets. Uh, so people do come into money perhaps that they've never seen, but then their money mindset, what happens is all the, those negative beliefs underneath can can rewind that. So they might things like, oh, this happened too quick. It's too good to be true. Money, that this won't last. I don't know how to cash it out. I'm, I'm scared to cash it out. All these sorts of things come up and we sort of end up being our own worst enemy. So money mindset is very crucial. And that yes, there is mindset, uh, but particularly the way we, we approach our money is, is significant in crypto investing. So it seems to me that, you know, having a mindset or believing you have a mindset, I guess half the answer to my next question, but how do you actually know when you've adopted the right money mindset to get us to that, I guess that $5 million mindset? <laughs> so I always say that it's not a, a flick of a switch. <laughs> it's, no. it's, a, it's a journey. Yeah. And, uh, and often it's just one of awareness. So really just asking questions, you know, uh, and keeping very much, um, as my mentors used to say to me, having ruthless self-evaluation. So how do I feel right now? What are my thoughts towards this? Do I, am I taking the right steps? Is there any way in which I'm sabotaging this? For example, I'm not taking the time to, to manage my assets well. I'm not storing them right. Or maybe I'm all of a sudden getting busier than I should to avoid you know, the wealth creation aspect of my portfolio or following the market and what's happening right now. So there's certain behaviours where simply just stopping to observe what we're actually doing will sh highlight a lot of where we're at. Um, and often we do know if we are showing up for ourselves, if we are in alignment, because we can sort of self-reflect on, on our own behaviours to see to see if we're on that, on that journey. So that's how I say, that's one of the things. But you do sort of know when you are moving closer because you find that your timing is better, you find that you're proud of your actions, that you're not allowing these sort of constant negative stories and thoughts to be lingering in the mind all the time um, or getting frustrated at your own self or others. I find that when we're doing the opposite of that is when we find that we're, we're more in alignment to a, to a healthier money mindset. You know, because we can be easily influenced by social media and then unfortunately it can be a bit of a demon for um, those who are looking at this space. And I wonder, given that, what is it, uh, April 2024, there's going to be a halving, therefore the mining of Bitcoin, for example, is going to become that much harder and therefore drive up prices. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so in terms of, you know, preparing for those types of things, should we be, um, I guess this is more tactical than st strategic, should we be focusing on uh, the main coins, the the stable coins, the new coins coming through. How does somebody choose? There's just a plethora of <laughs> options out there. And that's what really yeah. gets me really confused about this space. Yeah, and rightfully so. But the key is to diversify. So you have a small section in your conservative cryptos like your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, and then you diversify into what we call the more speculative medium to higher risk cryptocurrencies which are representing the growth of the market so if we want to know where we're going to get long-term value look for the growth sectors so anywhere like new blockchains coming to market how do we get exposure to them new DeFi technology how do we get exposure to that the metaverse and ai what particular cryptos represent those sort of say three to four major growth sectors and how do i have just a slice of each in, in a portfolio so that way you're well diversified and if one sort of drops the other might lift uh you never really you have a nice balanced approach but then you also have a nice piece of that pie which is in your conserve what we would call conservative cryptos like your bitcoin and ethereum and that's uh many people think oh, i'm just going to go buy all bitcoin but they miss this huge uh, growth opportunity in all of the other major sectors that are going to particularly, in my opinion, do very well in this upcoming bull market. You know what? The more I speak with you, Sadil, the more I realise this could be a twelve-hour call because I'm thinking about <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about the um, the utility of selection. <laughs> oh, you know, you look at a crypto yeah. and you think, just like Bitcoin initially was, you know, touted as being the next um, crypt, uh, the currency that you'd go and buy your your bread and milk with it's not become that it's become a store of wealth just like gold has become i i i believe maybe i'm wrong um so how do you what is this a matter of research you actually stepping back and going well look xrp ripple whatever um you go what's the utilitarian value of this this coin and is that the decision making rule that you follow how do you research which ones to get involved with 
yeah, well, firstly, I look for where is the most of the growth in this in the crypto market sector, and that's right. always going to be new blockchains, decentralized finance, the metaverse, AI. So that narrows, you know, the choice of thousands of coins down to probably, you know, a hundred, a couple of hundred very good coins. Yeah. And then you go of those sectors, which are the best performing cryptocurrencies that are within those sectors? So now we're we're not so much looking at a thousand different crypto, you know, 12, 15,000 different cryptos, we're looking at three to four sectors. And then what are the best performing cryptos within those sectors? And yeah. that's how we sort of cherry pick. And then if we can sort of get one to two cryptos from each one of those sectors, we then now have a portfolio of 10 to 15 cryptos. And that is uh, at the sweet spot for, for, for a nice portfolio that is manageable. And that can really go through a, a really good bull market. And you can sort of see the growth um, of, of each one of those particular coins that you're holding. So, uh, you know, I'm not a day trader. I'm not into Forex. I'd, I'd love to be, but, you know, it's fairly dangerous uh, for me at least. <laughs> um, but are you, is this a buy and hold situation or are you talking about doing, you know, quote unquote, the day trading with crypto and cryptocurrencies or a bit of both? Uh, really good question. We, we don't teach trading. So right. we yep. believe that long-term buy and hold strategies over a bull market entering at the right time in the right growth sectors is one of the best blueprints for success it's how my brother and i retired at such a young age beautiful it's how we've retired many many hundreds of students <laughs> and um and that's and that to me is is the success formula many people chase shiny objects they trade uh, they lose money they do bots they um they get up into these third-party apps that promise all these returns all of it is shiny object chasing, but the key is self custody investment strategy that is over two to four years in growth sectors with great utility that have the the opportunity to you know we've seen people do 10x's, 50x's, 100x's on even as high as 10,000 x's on cryptos that have great utility, and that doesn't happen overnight, um, but it can happen over a two to four year um, bull market cycle, and so. It's a complete different way to look at crypto, but you certainly don't need to be a trader. You don't. I don't look at candlesticks. I don't look at trading charts. You know, I I, so, I simply follow market the market. Let me just say how refreshing that is because the anxiety that Huge. I have felt and others have felt that I have spoken with, and the pain that can come along with not knowing which way to go about it. And again, coming back to social media, getting bombarded by paid advertisements from guys in their early 20s claiming to make you millions with this bot and this third party software. So you're suggesting stay away from those types of technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Because you've got, you know, 10,000 people using the same bot with the same algorithm, you're technically pushing the price against yourself. Yep. You know, so everyone's using the same algorithm to acquire. So therefore, you're, you're pushing the price up against yourself. Uh, but yes, fundamentally, self custody, you own the private keys, you hold 12, 10 to 15 cryptos in growth sectors, you ride the bull market. In like, I, I can, yeah, great levels of success can be yeah, achieved yeah, from, from doing that. And you don't have to be a trader, you don't have That's to be so good. sitting up at midnight, <laughs> yeah, crying in your, in your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I've just sold the house, uh, my beautiful wife. <laughs> You're what? <laughs> now, in, ter in terms of inflating of the market, we we've seen pump and dumps before. We've seen terms uh, like crypto whales that go into Discord groups, and I know I've been in there. I've seen it happen. They've said, "Guess what? We're doing this." And you know, you can have one or two. The eighty twenty rule: people in a complete market sector of, of a typical of one crypto really quickly inflate the market, then dump it. What do you say about whales? Can First of all, can you explain what a whale is and why they can be, I guess, detrimental? Yeah, so uh, whales, is it the silver lining? So whales are large crypto holders. So they typically hold millions of one token, or, you know, depending on how many of one token you can own. Yeah. Uh, they're like, oh, Bitcoin whales are people that hold, you know, billions of dollars of Bitcoin and they can influence the market significantly. So they can, they can, uh, for example, do a big sell. They can take a lot of profits and, and what we call dump the market, which means we drop the price yeah. and, uh, and people sort of, you know, frantically, they can trigger sell, big sell-offs, meaning they can trigger an actual bear market to begin after a bull market. So there is no way of stopping those sorts of events, but they don't always happen in uh, in five seconds, if that makes sense. Yeah. Typically, it's 
it's a pattern that you're observing. And there's also Twitter groups like whale alerts and things like that where you can sort of track the activity of what the whales are doing. So uh, it's a little <laughs> bit like a movement within a movement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the other, the, the positive side to that is, is it doesn't take much for them to, for example, allocate a percentage of their portfolio into a crypto that you may own and you can potentially see your portfolio double, triple, triple overnight. Like I've seen that happen to myself. And, and then you have the opportunity in that moment to then cash out if you liked. And so whilst we can see that, that, that sort of price volatility, the volatility is actually the game that is crypto and people are scared of the volatility. But I say, did you know the volatility is your best tool in the crypto market? It is what makes it the such a unique asset. It's what makes it so profitable. Yeah. So the whales, yes, they are there and they, they lurk in the, the deep oceans, you could say. <laughs> but they um they are also provide huge value because they allow a huge crypto potentially pump and uh, generate life-changing wealth for, for many people as well. Yeah. Um, and it's just about being strategic and not sitting on huge profits and being greedy and taking profit when you see some. Yeah, but that's what I was going to say now. You know, there, I guess in a longer time frame, Sadell, there is an element of trading per se, but it's not like um, like the day trading that we touched on. But there, it is important to take profit? Well, I say that. You know, some people can sit on these huge portfolios and it's really just the number the market owes you. It's an IOU. Yeah. It's not really, you're not a crypto millionaire, so to say, until you actually materialize that wealth. And and actually learning how to sell is a different skill set in itself because 90% of it is, is based in human emotions. So that's why I always say we just need to have, we need to have a plan, you know, not to be greedy and and also, yes, there is a degree of trading because you somewhat are selling and buying and looking for those opportunistic times to yeah. sell. Um, but most of it comes down to looking at the fundamentals in the market at the moment. So you go, how loud is the crypto market? How many news stations are promoting it? Did my taxi driver talk about it today? <laughs> you know, what, what's the price of Bitcoin sitting at? How overinflated is my portfolio right now? What type of gains am I sitting on? If I'm looking at my portfolio 10 times a day and feeling euphoric, they're, they're all triggers, okay? So while we might not be a trader, we might have the triggers to go, okay, I think I'm going to take 5% of my profit out now in profits. And that might mean five grand, 50 grand. It might mean a million, whatever it is. Yep. But it's the discipline of taking something to materialize something else, um, not just have it all sitting in, in the crypto market. Absolutely. So, what, uh, you know, you're turning things uh, like the cryptocurrency that you've got um, some cream on you're taking that out and then you're converting it into real estate and that sort of asset allocation. What sort of um, percentage of asset allocation would you have in your portfolio for crypto? Well, <laughs> this is the thing they say a millennial millionaires hold typically over about 75% of their portfolio. Sorry, uh, yeah, millennial millionaires, that's right, hold about 75% of their portfolio in cryptocurrencies, wow. which is astounding. <laughs> and if you think of the the... This, there's about $68 trillion worth of baby boomer money to be handed down just in the States alone to millennials over the next decade or two. Yep. You look at where the millennials are investing and that in itself is a huge catalyst to where this market is going as well. Uh, so a lot of the time, I mean, where, for example, myself, I'm most heavily invested into the crypto market, but I also diversify and into store value items. I love paintings, I love precious metals, um, then also collectible cars and then property, you know, so how do I move money from one asset to another? And it is a nice feeling to preserve profit in a different way, slightly outside of the crypto market, not sort of have all those eggs in one basket. It's very interesting. Have some, tangi have some tangible things. It's very interesting <laughs> that you talk this way. I read a, a, a book recently about the Rothschilds and those who actually control 80% of the globe's wealth, and that's exactly how they distribute their wealth and maintain it through the eons of time through generations of family. So you're, you're definitely onto something there and that's something for everybody to be taking away from this wonderful call today. Now, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, uh, leaving crypto on exchanges. Is that a dangerous thing to do? And what are wallets and why should we consider using those? Yeah, great question. And that really is comes down again to the self-custody. And I always say exchanges, look at them as shopping centres, okay? So we don't we buy stuff, but we don't leave it in the shopping centre, do we? No. Um, so we bring it home, you know, and when we bring it home, we're technically in the crypto world, we're putting it into what we call a wallet. And those wallets are 
what we call hot or cold storage wallets, but basically there's a safe place to store our, our assets. So anything like the Trezor, the Ledger, they're the sort of brand names for those, those yep. um, wallets. Uh, and that's where you want to be moving that money because that if you don't have the private keys, which is the ownership of that crypto, uh, you typically don't own it. And what we saw in 2022 was the sort of mismanagement of, of lots of exchange CEOs and, and a sort of a bit of a domino effect of, of these sorts of collapses. And this is the thing. You hear about people losing money or getting scammed, and it's typically because they're not being responsible with their funds. Yeah. Uh, when you simply move your money off the exchange into a wallet you control, you've now removed yourself from 99% of the scam narrative out there. Okay. And that 1% then comes down to where are you storing that <laughs> that wallet? Okay. <laughs> yep. Leaving it in the top drawer. We've <laughs> oh, no, no, no. scribbling your private keys down. Oh, what's this USB here, Daddy? Yeah. <laughs> it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so really it's um then it comes down to our own man management of that but always um look at exchanges as a touch point as a shopping experience but never as a place where you store your crypto ever so given all the questions that i could potentially ask of you i'm putting the the needs of my audience in mind because they're probably lapping this up and i really appreciate it Sid. i really do um if you are a brand new person to this i know where i'd go i'd come and see you but if you're a new person and you want to do this on your own what is the very first thing that you would recommend a newbie do to get involved? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the first thing before you buy anything is to, I would say, is to have the attitude of being a contrarian. And that is my single biggest piece of advice I give to every new investor into the market. And to be a contrarian means to be opposite to groupthink. And if you can do that continuously through the crypto market, you'll be successful. And the second thing from then is working out what are you going to allocate into the market and what does it what does a number what's a safe number for you? Is it five hundred bucks? Is it two grand? Is it maybe ten grand? What does that number look like for you? And and keep it a number where you're not afraid to have a play with it and see what happens. And then of course get actually onto an exchange, uh, register, buy a bit of crypto and pop it onto a wallet and then then from there, you can pretty much ride this wave and sort of track it and see how it's performing. So they are my sort of, like I would say, a short list of things yeah, that opening, someone could immediately yeah. do. Yeah. 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 It's interesting because then then my next leading question would be, you've got this wallet, you've got this little bit of crypto, a couple of bits of this and that. Um, how long before I go and actually look at the, the graphs and go, wow, I'm, I'm actually going to the moon. Do I get rid of some of it? You know, when do you know that? Do you do you start joining groups and and get getting training from yourself, or do you join your newsletter, which I have? Um, what's the next step from there? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we do provide a lot of free education through our newsletter that on um, Digital Wealth Group, uh, so you can get a lot of insight into what what is going on with the market. You kind of get a general consensus of where we're at. But it's really about looking at those numbers and saying, you know, am I sitting on a lot of good profit right now? Is my portfolio on a 5x or a 10x right now? And am I being greedy? Like where else Where else would I be sitting on a 10x and not take some profit? Yeah. You know? So, um, And it's really just looking at those numbers. So you can actually have some applications where you can track your assets. Uh, you can also um, reach out to us if you're needing support. Uh, we do do one-on-one -on -one coaching and help people get into the market, help diversify, get their wallets set up things like that. So, you know, we do have, we do offer that one-on-one -on -one hand holding for the person who's a bit nervous, but then if you're adventurous and you're feeling like you'd like to explore this space on your own, yep. uh, you can also do that and you can follow our free newsletter and things like that. So do you have a there course? are many, many ways to get in. Do you also have a course? Is that yes. a thing? Yeah, absolutely. So we have the cryptocurrency fast launch program, which is, it gives you a, a short list of coins it gives you a model portfolio it gives you all the market updates and pretty much all of the absolute necessities you need to to maintain and get through a bull market um, when to buy when to sell the, the weekly market um, news and what's happening and, and then sort of how to also create passive income from the cryptos that you're holding so how do I actually take these cryptos and make them work for me just like you would in a bank lock your money up and get paid interest you can do that in crypto as well so there's um, some many, many ways that you can like multiply and scale your portfolio. Yep. So, and then in, within that course, you also get private coaching. So you get um, half a dozen one-on-one -on -one sessions, one-hour calls with your coach, going through your portfolio, setting everything up, clicking and setting up on the exchanges, doing all the nitty gritty. And, uh, and then you get training over a whole year, masterclasses and just interesting talks and 
slowly the learning comes after and and there is a bit of a timing piece when it comes to crypto i always say that another one of my one-liners is that the market waits for no one yeah uh, so there is a timing piece and i do say we have a window of um from here we are start, start of march roughly about three to five months before we really start to see that parabolic growth in the market yep. so i do say if you are looking to get in the timing is now yep. i would not be procrastinating um and if you really want to ride this 18 month bull market that we've just entered into we are only at the very tip of the very beginning and uh and i would say it'd be very rewarding for those action takers out there very exciting there you go that's yeah. going to be a lead in for sure and certain now i i wonder um who who are you attracting to these services the most are they mum and dad investors who's your, who's who do you work with yeah great question so we work with mainly for example people like i would say like my mum and dad uh, people that are not tech savvy perhaps maybe they're a bit nervous of the whole digital space um so people that are mainly uh wanting to get exposure they're um i would say maybe they're they're retired or they um, have self-managed super funds i'd like to put it to work a little bit better maybe they have an investment base that would like to get into the market but are simply not willing to go through so we find the 20 and the 30 year olds are pretty much sort of nut everything out themselves and they'll go down to the deep forums of the it's web and learn bits. everything <laughs> yeah. um, in the discord groups uh, but our the, the type of client we work with simply don't like that so they might be um you know maybe in the later half of their life and then they don't want to be learning all the tech side they find the risk is too high so they would like to have someone coach them through that process so that is yeah. typically who we're working with so we even have um one of our most successful students they're in their 80s uh husband and wife team actually from around brisbane location fantastic and uh you know they're, they're fully retired and they've got about eight grandchildren and then yeah. now they've got generational wealth and they um uh, they make the joke that they need to be reminded of, of what they're invested into on every coaching call because they're, <laughs> they're, they you know that it's just too much to follow along for them yeah. but that's the kind of level of support that we give yeah you know and i can feel a level of trust and i've i've spoken with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who are doing incredible things and you know, you, you get a feeling about someone and you get a feeling that you can trust them and the people behind them because at the end of the day, Sidel, you're leading the charge, you're the face of the business and everything you say people take notice of and it's a real credit to you, the work that you're doing. So let's talk about your book, um, The All-Time High. Let's break it down so that people can not only find it but they can understand what they're going to get from it and whether or not that would be the best place for them to start to learn about the crypto space. Yeah, absolutely. So All Time High was a, um, a piece about the seven years that we've been each educating for about seven years now. And I found it was a collection. I needed to put together a collection of all of our uh, sort of 101s of investing into this market that I would call it, it is the most conversational piece that you're probably ever going to read about getting into the crypto market. So I call it the fireside chat of about this asset class. And it's a really good piece. It addresses all of the, the main fears that people have. Um, it addresses the bullish catalysts that will drive this market, this sort of introductory steps to get into this market, as well as our money mindset. And it has a whole range of uh, wonderful success stories of people beginning with nothing in this space and building their wealth up, uh, all of our favorite one-liners and, and investment takeaways. So it's full of absolute gold, especially for someone who's never entered this market. They're feeling nervous. They might be a bit skeptical. It's a great piece to just create your first foundation for getting into this market. There you go. Very great, concise summary of the book. Thank you very much. And when people want to, um, you know, find that book, is that an Amazon thing? Yeah, absolutely. Amazon, Booktopia, Barnes & Noble. Uh, you can get it from any of your, any whichever one is your favourite book distributor. So yep. it's our all-time high, The Power of Cryptocurrencies and How to Invest the Right Way. We talked about what lights you up, what what drives you to get out of bed in the morning. But how, is, what is it, how do you feel when you see the people that you're working with get results with your methods? Oh, look, I mean... This is the thing uh, we talk about legacy, you know, and we talk about generational wealth through cryptocurrency and what is our legacy that we want in life. And and I look at this as, as a legacy that will live on for hundreds of years from the people, from the wealth that people are creating here today. And it is such a rewarding and wonderful experience to see people 
that can remove themselves from the fear narratives of financial pressures, of paying mortgages, uh, of the bills, of all of the economic uncertainty, and to all of a sudden push all that aside and say, you know what, I've got my life back, I've got freedom back, I've got my time, I've got my wealth and that is a gift. That is an incredible thing to give to someone. And that is why I love what I do. That is why I could talk for 12 hours yeah. <laughs> love on crypto yeah. because it's an endless giving game, the crypto market. Absolutely. I always say it gives to you, crypto gives to you what you give back to it. And it, and that's why I love love talking about it and love sharing. This well, I can, I can tell that you do because you light up um, you throughout the call in different aspects and your knowledge is um, far superior to anything that I've seen on the show in the past. And, and I'd like to thank you for that. Now, when people want to take that first step, um, where are they going to find you? What website are, they, are you on LinkedIn? Where can they find you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the first place we go to digitalwealthgroup.com.au, you will see a, you can subscribe right there. You also get invitations to our 90 minute free trainings. I do host a monthly live webinar, which is all about the market and what's happening and how, where we're sitting right now. So, uh, we have those running all the time. So if you're subscribed to Digital Wealth Group, you'll be sure to get all of those invitations. And if you do need to engage with any of our services, maybe you're wanting to get your portfolio set up and into this market yesterday, um, certainly reach out and we can offer and discuss those uh, packages for you and what we can do to, to get that going for you. Well, there you go. In summary, if you're on this call today, I'll be making it very easy for you to get into this space because I'm going to be providing the links back to Sidel and her wonderful team and all the work that she's done and to the book and so on and so forth. So make sure you do go ahead and check out all of that information. With all that being said, Sidel, this has been an absolute cracker of a call. Thank you very much for joining me on the show today. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful and, and thanks to all of our listeners. 